Al Jazeera's Gaza bureau chief mourns his wife, daughter, son and grandson killed in an Israeli attack. The majority of the war's victims are women and children, with journalists among the dead too. Is anywhere in the Gaza Strip safe? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. Wael Dahdou is one of the best-known journalists in the Gaza Strip, just as his colleague Shireen Abu Akhle was in the occupied West Bank. Israeli forces shot and killed Shireen while she was on assignment in Jenin last year. Wael's wife, daughter, son and grandson were killed in an airstrike on a refugee camp in central Gaza on Wednesday, a place they had left their home for, a place they believed to be safe. Despite the tragedy, Wael has pledged to keep reporting on Israel's war on Gaza. No doubt it will not stop me from doing my duties, no matter what the price we are paying, the voice of Al Jazeera. My voice will continue to tell the truth. In a few minutes, I will go live on air. Shame on the Israeli occupation forces. More women and children have been killed in this war than men or even combatants. Hospitals, schools, refugee camps and apartment blocks have been razed to the ground in relentless Israeli attacks. Journalists have been victims too. In less than three weeks, 24 media workers have been killed, 20 of them Palestinians, according to the Committee for the Protection of Journalists. In the face of such violence, is anywhere in Gaza safe for anyone? We'll be discussing this with our guests in a moment. But first, let's talk to a journalist and close colleague of Wael Dahdu. Al Jazeera producer Safwat al Kalut has covered Gaza for the past 12 years, and I've been lucky enough to work with him over that time. And he joins us from Deir al-Bala in central Gaza. Safwat, thanks for joining us. I know it's a very, very difficult time for you at the moment. Just tell us, first of all, about Whale and his family. Well, you know, um, you have been uh, to Gaza several times, and you know how the relationship between Al Jazeera teams. Whale is not only a colleague. Whale is a big brother, and he's close to everybody in uh, in terms of uh, Jazeera team, you know, he's uh, the reference and he is the advisor for everyone since he is uh, the, the most experienced uh, journalist in uh, in Gaza, if not in Palestine, uh, and in Al Jazeera team in Gaza. So, uh, you know, um, we have been sharing a lot of social and personal uh, his ceremonies, including birthdays, including uh, the mm. marriage of his son last year. So uh, we are a family uh, together with Ma with the Wael and uh, the other colleagues. You know, I know Wael for, we worked together in Al Jazeera for 12 years, but uh, I know him for more than 23 years or 22 to be more accurate. So I know, I know him when he used to work for local daily as uh, as a reporter, and then he moved to Al Arabiya satellite channel, and then finally, uh, for our luck, he joined Al Jazeera. Uh, he is the bravest journalist, by the way, I have ever met and I have uh, ever worked with. Uh, despite all these conditions, hard conditions, and and working under the fire, he decided to stay in Gaza. Uh, and keep, keep reporting, walk and talk, live from the rubble, from the destruction. And yeah. I met him okay. three days ago, and I told him, uh, why, why are you are staying here? He said, where else can we go? Simply. So he, okay. he thought that he secured his family, moving them or displacing them to al Nusayrat refugee, refugee camp. But unfortunately, as he said, no place is safe. All right. You're a journalist and you're a family man. How have you been able to manage both those aspects of your life? The family is the most important, of course. Well, that's the, the real and the ma most major challenge that I have been facing as a father. And have uh, I was forced with my to get displaced or to displace with my family. Uh, you know, we have to meet the minimum need at least uh, for the family. Uh, we spend a long time looking, carrying bottles of water and lining up at some wells just to find some water for our children. This is number one. Number two, the food, you know, the essential food, which is the bread. We line up at the bakery 
to bring food. And it's not even safe, you know. Some people, they were killed while lining yes. up at the water uh, water wells or at the bakeries. So we have been reporting that even our, uh, ourselves. So this is the first challenge. The second thing is the fear, you know. The, uh, the family looks, or the children, they look at the father as the main source of power and support. And they could read the fear and the weakness in their father. They could understand it. So this is psychologically, mm -hmm. it's very uh, dangerous. And for the long term, when the family loses the faith in the main source of power, which is the father. So All I right. asked my daughter a few days ago, how do you feel that? She said, if you are okay, we are okay. This, gave, this even add more challenges to the challenges that we are facing in, in our work and in our, okay. in our, uh, with our families. All right. Uh, Safwat, Safwat al Kalut, thank you for talking to us from Gaza. Please, please look after yourself and your family. Your, you and all your colleagues in Gaza in, are in all our thoughts. Um, uh, please, please try take care as best you can. Safwat, thank you very much. Trying our best. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. Thank you very much. Let's bring in our guests. In New York is Jody Ginsburg, president of the Committee to Protect Journalists, a non-profit organisation that promotes media freedom and defends the rights of journalists. In Ramallah, in the occupied West Bank, is Mustafa Barghouti, secretary general of the Palestinian National Initiative. And in the Honduran capital, Tegucigalpa, is Irene Khan, UN special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. A warm welcome to you all. Um, first of all, Mustafa Barghouti in Ramallah, can you just tell us about how important Wales reporting is in the Arabic-speaking world? Well, Wales has a very, uh, very close and warm colleague who, who has been doing wonderful work in terms of journalism, uh, covering what was happening in Gaza all, all these years. Uh, he has covered so many wars that happened, uh, so many aggressions that happened on Gaza. I personally knew him very well, and uh, I happened to be in Gaza during the 2014 war, uh, during which time uh, we met many times also. Uh, he did a wonderful professional job, and uh, I think there were two icons of Al Jazeera work in uh, the occupied territories, uh, Wa'il Dahdouh in Gaza and Shirin Abu Aqli in uh, Ramallah. And uh, unfortunately, both of them had this terrible tragedy. Shirin Abu Akli was uh, killed by an Israeli sniper. And the most recent international commission reported uh, very clearly that she was assassinated for no reason uh, by an Israeli sniper. And now Dahdouh is losing his family, his, uh, his, uh, his wife, his son, his daughter. It's a terrible tragedy. But also it uh, indicates uh, what journalists have to live through in Palestine. Uh, yes. Let me add that uh, up till this moment, 22 journalists in Gaza have been killed during this terrible attack of Israel yes. during the last 20 days. 22 journalists. And let me also remind you that uh, during the last 10 years, in, addi in addition to these 22 journalists, 52 other journalists, including Shirin Abu Akleh, were also killed by the Israeli army in West Bank and Gaza. Yes, OK. Uh, Mustafa, thank you very much. Uh, Jody, there is perhaps no more dangerous in the world to operate as a journalist than Gaza at, a, at the moment. What are the challenges you understand that they're facing above the ordinary challenges they would face from reporting uh, from Gaza during previous conflicts? Well, as you heard, this is the deadliest conflict for journalists reporting on this region ever in the 30 years that um, CPJ is documenting this. And in fact, it looks like it's the worst period for journalists covering conflict anywhere ever in those 30 years. It's extremely challenging uh, to cover Gaza at the moment. There is nowhere to go. There's very, there's nowhere to hide. Um, and so, um, and yet we are reliant on those journalists inside Gaza to tell us what's happening. Um, everyone who is a journalist has effectively become a war reporter, and that's been the case for many Gazan journalists for, for many years. Uh, they coping with challenges, including lack of electricity, uh, obviously the dangers 
of um, repeated airstrikes and so on. Um, and all of that while they are immersed and living among friends and family as, as well was. Irene, um, what do you understand of the, well, uh, uh, from your perspective, the importance, of course, of freedom of expression and opinion? What do you understand of the, of the challenges of uh, journalists trying to do that in Gaza? Well, first of all, as you said, freedom of expression is extremely important at all, particularly in times of conflict. How else would we get news? But in this conflict, uh, it is indiscriminate disproportionate attacks against all civilians. Journalists are civilians under international humanitarian law. They have no protection. The civilians who are in Gaza have no protection from indiscriminate, disproportionate attacks. So what good is your jacket with press written on it going to do? What good are your helmets going to do? That's what's being proven on the ground. There, there are no rules that are being followed uh, by, by Israel in this uh, conflict, no rules uh, applicable to civilians are being respected. That is an immense tragedy for the people on the ground, but I think for international humanitarian law, the entire system of the rule of law is under pressure here, and journalists on the front line are the ones who are showing with their courage and resilience how much uh, blatant disregard of international humanitarian law is taking place in Gaza right now. Mustafa, we're trying to look a bit at how, how journalists are able to report from Gaza and also the occupied West Bank. Uh, do, you see a way that the, do you see a way the Palestinians are reported about is a differently as to the way Israelis are reported about? Of course, there is a very huge difference, and uh, especially during this terrible war. Uh, Israeli perspective is presented repeatedly and so many times. And uh, even when it's blunt lies about what has happening, like that whole misleading and black media information about decapitating children or raping women, which, which many journalists had to apologize about reporting, like CNN reporters and Los Angeles Times as well. But these lies keep repeating. And uh, unfortunately, what I see in many um, international media outlets is that they do not only report what's ha what, what Israelis are saying, they do not report what Palestinians are saying. But on top of that, if you are rarely interviewed, I mean, like they would have 10 interviews with, 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 uh, with Israelis and maybe one occasional interview with a Palestinian, then the, the strange thing is that the, the broadcaster or the, the one who is running the interview will be uh, not only bringing in Israeli point of view, but also repeating the same propaganda while he's interviewing a Palestinian. And uh, that by itself shows you how, how, how discute is the situation, how unfair and how improper it is. And uh, the problem also is that when they report about Israeli situation, it's uh, reporting about human beings, a person who, <clears throat> a child or a family who has been affected, but then it's numbers only on the Palestinian side. And that's why the state, the case of uh, Wa'il Dahdouh maybe brings uh, maybe some light on the fact that these 7,000 Palestinians killed and more than 3,000 children killed are human beings. They're not just yes. numbers. They're the people who lived and worked, their fathers, mothers, children, uh, sisters and brothers. And that's exactly what is missing in the, most of the international media outlets. It's really, really uh, a lot of discrimination, a lot of unacceptable di the discrimination. Uh, and, and more than that, okay. um, the lies keep coming out from yeah. Israel and they keep repeating them. The, especially one last point is that they, they tend to blame the victim, mm. blaming the victim. They blame us for being bombarded. They're blaming us for being killed. This is so unacceptable. Jody, um, you journalists operating in Gaza and also in the occupied West Bank as well, where Mustafa is at the moment. Do you, what are your, it might seem like an obvious question, I guess, but what are your main concerns for journalists reporting there? It is, it's also now very dangerous for them in the West Bank as well, with increased settler activity. It's incredibly difficult to be safe reporting on this area. Not only do we have, obviously, um, the, the military launches potentially ground invasion, 
But increasingly, journalists are at risk when they're going out to report from potentially um, people who want to uh, take revenge on journalists almost for reporting what's happening. We've seen cases of journalists, uh, even in Israel, being hauled out of their cars, um, being harassed, being threatened. Um, we've seen targeting of military, um, sorry, of media installations to prevent, uh, which would obviously prevent the media from reporting and getting the news out. So it's not just um, the military risks that journalists face, it's also the threats and harassment from perhaps ordinary individuals, from the police and others um, for doing their jobs. Irene, I wanted to ask you about the, the challenges of uh, battling uh, fake information, fake news, if you like. There's been a lot of uh, concerns that major social media groups like Meta that manage Facebook and Instagram have been heavily censoring Palestinian content in Arabic com compared to how they deal with content in Hebrew. There is this need for freedom of information. How do you balance those two needs? Well, uh, first of all, there is no full and free access to all journalists uh, to Gaza or to the West Bank. That in itself, I think, is one way in which news is being censored. There are only some sources uh, that can, can work there. Uh, all journalists don't have access. Uh, secondly, I have received a lot of reports uh, that uh, social media platforms are taking down posts. In the case of Meta, there was already a, a, a judgment uh, or, or a decision by its own oversight board about its disproportionate removal of Palestinian posts. Meta claims that it has sought to uh, now improve its uh, content uh, uh, policies, content moderation policies. But of course, complaints are still coming in and it's very hard to judge what is actually happening because all these social media platforms, as you know, have very opaque uh, ways of managing uh, content. What we also know is that states, uh, a number of European states, for <clears throat> example, have tried to stop protests, pro-Palestinian protests, have tried to remove, for example, Palestinian uh, flags uh, when, when demonstrators are using it. Uh, that type of censorship is, of course, not permissible under international law. On the ground, I can just only just imagine how terrible it must be for journalists who are still reporting uh, for someone like while uh, the tragedy that he has faced. Very rarely has there been such a demand on the courage and resilience of journalists on the ground. But full and free access to all media should be a fundamental uh, requirement in a situation like this, because that's the way from diverse sources that readers will be able to make out what is propaganda and what is fact. At the moment, that is not being allowed by Israel. There is a blockade, not just on civilians, not just on humanitarian aid, but also on media access. Jody, yes, you wanted to come in on that. I wanted to come in on that to, to echo that point. Because of the quantity of myths and disinformation we are seeing, that's why it's so vital that we have a plurality of media covering this conflict. It's why we're particularly concerned at the Committee to Protect Journalists by threats to, for example, censor Al Jazeera. Um, it is really important in this moment in time where people are finding it very difficult to know what to believe, that you have a plurality of media able to report what is happening, even in the face of unimaginable threats and pressure. And, Jody, I wanted to ask you as well about journalists operating in Israel. Some Israeli journalists have not been able to question uh, the actions of their country because of the atmosphere that in Israel you're either for us or against us at the moment. What are you hearing ab about that? We're hearing similar concerns that people have been threatened for asking questions. That's the job of journalists and journalism, is to hold power to account, to ask difficult questions. Um, it's perfectly possible to do that and remain patriotic, remain um, a, a, a citizen of your country, um, and you should not be threatened or prevented from doing so, um, either by the government or officials or by the mob. Mustafa, can I ask you, you, you? you've done, you? yeah. well, you've done yeah. so many interviews with foreign media and many don't speak to you until there's conflict in the Palestinian territories. What, what are the sort of biggest challenges you face and the ignorance you sometimes come across with journalists who rarely speak to you? 
Well, as you said, we never looked at and uh, never interviewed uh, unless something is happening to Israelis. I mean, uh, before this whole war started, for eight months, we've lost in uh, West Bank 248 Palestinians, including 40 children. One of them was only two and a half years old. We had settlers burning houses, settlers burning uh, cars, attacking communities. No, none of these uh, foreign journalists were here or even tried to, re to, re to report about that. Very few, if any. Uh, but that's one example. Once an Israeli is hurt or once uh, something happens to Israel, then everybody is here. That is the reality, actually, unfortunately. But I want to add something about silencing sure. others, silencing the journalists, silencing the people. Uh, before this attack started, we, we know that there was an act of intellectual terror being practiced by different Zionist organizations and Zionist lobbies in different countries of the world. The best example of that is Germany. Whoever tries to say something, I mean, is immediately attacked by this lobby, forcing people to resign from their jobs, threatening them, etc. But it's now gone much worse. Uh, I think the basic approach of any journalist who works professionally, who doesn't belong to either side, is to be balanced in their approach. And uh, we've just heard in the process of witch hunting that is taking place against this, not anybody, but the Secretary General of the United Nations, Guterres, who just dared to say that there is this didn't happen in a vacuum and there is occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, America, uh, United States admits there is occupation and uh, the United States admits there are settlers. But because he said that, now they're witch hunting him. And the foreign minister of Israel in the United Nations had the guts yes. to say that from now on, there is no place for balanced positions. He's saying, and that's only fascists would say that, either you are on our side completely or you are, on our, you are our enemy. Thanks, In addition yeah. to that, let me mention very quickly a few things. First of all, journalists are not allowed into Gaza now. No. Those who are there are there, but journalists are in Jerusalem. They would not let them go to Gaza except if they are behind the Israeli army and if they are fed yes. with what the Israeli army is telling them. Second, yeah. they are now arresting our journalists in the West Bank. People who have been, uh, even people who have been interviewed, uh, just commentators, they are yes. arrested because they are expressing their views. And then I think, I think Mr. Dahdouh was very correct when he, when he thought that the killing of his family was an act of revenge because of what he has been doing honestly to report what's happening in Gaza. OK. Um, Irene, polarised media environment yeah. is not unique to Israel, of course, but this level of conflict <laughs> intensifies it, doesn't it? Of course, it certainly does. And that is why I want to re-emphasise the importance of human rights. Human rights are universal. The obligations of states to uphold human rights is also uh, universal. There is a right to media freedom, independent, free, plural, diverse media. And that is being denied. That is being uh, uh, run roughshod uh, by uh, the Israeli authorities and, and others at the moment, uh, some allies of Israel, which I think is a very, very dangerous uh, precedent that is being created here and has been over the years. I agree that uh, attention uh, to the Palestinian problem, uh, that there's not sufficient attention. Ukraine wiped out all other conflicts. Yeah. And now, of course, there's a lot of attention uh, to the Middle East. And I hope that this is not going to be a transient thing. Uh, it has to be solved. There's a, there are deeper root causes of this conflict that continue. And the victims of that are the civilians in Gaza, the uh, people living in the West Bank. This problem has to be solved. Otherwise, I think the international community is only creating more problems uh, for the future. And Jody, can I ask you about that as well, the challenges of reporting in such a, in such a polarised media environment? It's something, unfortunately, we're seeing internationally. It's particularly acute um, in this conflict. It's an environment in which people are highly personalised. They're highly personalised attacks. So in addition to all of the physical attacks that people receive, there's highly personalised attacks for those covering the conflict, say, from outside Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and it's really important, and I, and I want to emphasise this, that 
the job of a journalist is to go out and report the facts, what they see outside. We always talk about, you know, our job is not to, to take two views about whether it's raining, it's to go outside and tell you whether it's raining or not. And that's really important. It's really important that we recognise that the job of journalists is to report the facts and that people should not be targeted either physically, online, harassed or, or receive any other mistreatment for doing their jobs. And Mustafa, very quickly, the last, the last question to you, but how challenging is doing Palestinian diplomacy at the moment? How difficult is it to get uh, the Palestinian voice uh, heard? It's not difficult, but it's not impossible, and nothing will restrain us. We will keep doing whatever we can. We'll keep trying to penetrate the, 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 this black forest of uh, misleading information and fabrications to bring the true light to the people, to bring the truth to the people. And I always say to my colleagues, you need only to do one-tenth of what the Israelis do because the truth is on our side. And I think we should not save any moment without trying to do that because this is what could protect the lives of people who are being killed now around the clock. When, five, when every five minutes a Palestinian is killed and every 10 minutes a Palestinian child loses his life. All right, life. folks, we're out of time, but thank you very much for your contributions. Thanks to our guests, to Jody Ginsburg, Mustafa Barghouti and Irene Khan. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here, bye for now.